Um, again, this is the limits of fixed wireless technology for rural communities. I'm Nell Geyser with the Communications Workers of America. Uh, I'll be moderating today and I will hand it to uh, Linda Hinton, Vice President of Communications Workers of America, District 4, to kick us off. Well, thank you, Nell, and thank you, uh, everyone, for being on today. Good afternoon. Uh, CWA is pleased to partner with the CTC Technology to bring you today's webinar, an important new report examining the limitations of fixed wireless technology for rural areas. As Vice President of the Communication Workers of America District 4 in the Midwest, and those states include Ohio, Indiana, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Illinois, I am very aware of the challenges facing rural communities and that lack high speed broadband today. Our members who work as technicians and customer service agents hear from their customers and neighbors about the challenges of living with very slow and unreliable internet connections when big internet service providers won't upgrade or build in their area. CWA's Broadband Brigade of member activists have been educating our communities and elected leaders about the technology superiority of fiber broadband, which is well-documented fact. The brigade is made up of frontline technicians from across the country who have training and experience in the functionalities and limits of various broadband technologies. From this firsthand experience building and operating the nation's broadband networks, we understand the stakes in deciding how to expend limited public resources. Industry leaders recognize that $42 billion is not enough to cover every underserved location with high quality broadband. Certain segments of the industry are using this SACTI mindset to pitch inferior technologies in order to stretch the money further. But the reality is there is far more than $42 billion flowing into deployment from the American Rescue Plan and other appropriations, even as market demand is motivating ISPs to deploy fiber at an unprecedented rate on their own dime. What we cannot do is expend significant portions of these public dollars on inferior technologies that have slower, less reliable service than fiber. It's just not worth it. And if we go that misguided route, we will once again leave behind lower income, rural and tribal communities. That's what the study shows in terms of dollars and cents. I won't steal the thunder from Andrew, so I'll just say that CWA has been advocating for universal affordable broadband for many years and building fiber to everyone is a critical piece of that. We are hopeful that state policymakers will adopt strong fiber preference rules. We are also hopeful the workers who build these networks will get the support of their elected leaders to implement strong labor standards. The bead rules require priority to be given to application applicants that have good labor records and plans to be in compliance with labor laws and encourage preference for high road employers who have quality training, progressive wage scales, and respect for workers' rights. A high quality job is a safe job where workers are empowered to speak up for themselves and their coworkers when they need additional PPE or better working conditions. You can learn more about CWA's campaign on broadband at buildbroadbandbetter.org and sign up for updates. I look forward to Andrew's presentation and to the discussion uh, with you afterwards. Thank you. Thank you so much, Linda. And You're I welcome. will just uh, briefly introduce Andrew, um, who is a, a very experienced engineer who is CEO and CTO of CTC Technology and Energy. Andrew specializes in planning, designing, and overseeing the implementation of broadband um, networks, sorry, I'm just doing some tech here. Um, and uh, over the course of more than 25 years in the field, Andrew has developed broadband engineering strategy and specifications for dozens of fiber and wireless networks in both rural and urban areas, ranging in size from small towns to large states to nationwide efforts like the New Zealand Fiber to the Premises Initiative. So we're so grateful to have 
Andrew among um, the experts that we can turn to to really understand the, the technical nature of uh, broadband technology, the, the technical aspects of um, how we make decisions about where to invest. So I'll, I'll hand it over to you, Andrew. Thank you, Nell. And um, I'll ask uh, our uh, team to put up the uh, slide presentation for, uh, for today. Um, I want to start off by um, thanking the uh, members of the CWA for um, sponsoring this, this report and the Benton Institute for Broadband and Society for publishing it. And the, the report should be published um, online at the conclusion of this talk today. Uh, next slide, please. So um, first of all, um, I, I think that the, one of the significances of, of this work that the CTC team put together is I, I believe in recent years, it's, it's really the only uh, study of its kind that has gone into extensive detail on um, looking at both from the performance perspective and the cost perspective, uh, the, um, the, the fiber optic technologies and the, and the wireless technologies with the emphasis on rural areas uh, it's very timely because, um, as Nell mentioned, the, um, uh, the the spending that's going to uh, it's already underway actually for um, for broadband and the uh, the fact that uh, it, it is a once in a in a lifetime um, opportunity to to get this right and to make a choice that uh, that will last uh, for a long time. So what what the report uh, covers uh, is uh, the. Uh, the technologies, uh, what uh, um, what we can expect now and in the future for performance, and the challenges that both technologies uh, have. Um, how much bandwidth uh, households need, and why? As, as many of you are aware, um, the FCC has been working uh, with various broadband standards, uh, 25 by three most recently. Now we're looking at 100 by, by 20 megabits per second. Those are the download and upload uh, speeds. <clears throat> but we took an independent look at uh, some of the rationale as to uh, what, what those numbers might look like in the future. And then um, I, I spent some time going through the, the cost models for um, different um, unserved communities that we are, um, that, that we've put into detailed uh, street by street models uh, to um, assess what it would be to go in and do the best possible job with a fixed wireless technology and what it would be to, to also um, take that approach with a fiber to the premises approach. So next slide, please. So um, to sort of cut to the chase here, if we are looking long term, and we most certainly are with the, um, with the, the, the stimulus uh, spending that's that's going to be um, underway. Uh, we're we're looking at uh, fiber as the best choice for the overwhelming majority of uh, underserved rural areas. And as I'm going to explain, um, first is it's because it fiber has uh, much more capacity uh, than wireless. Uh, this is. Uh, true right now in terms of a snapshot of these technologies as they exist. And more importantly, it's true when you look at the physics of, um, of what goes on when you transmit through fiber versus what happens when you are working with uh, spectrum, um, essentially. Um, if we look in the long term, we find that the, the costs are actually quite comparable. And by the long term, we're, we're talking about uh, 20 to 30 years. Um, and, and one of the key factors in this, their, their number that we'll go through, but one of the key factors is that with wireless technologies, you, you stand them up, they work, they do what they do, and then they require replacement um, at the technological end of, of life. And so uh, of the total capital cost, a much larger percentage is just constantly having to be replaced and renewed. And we know what that means in the context of grant funding. What, what that means is that you get your shot with the grant funding, and then you, you have to go looking around after that. And that's not always an option, uh, especially in a rural area where, where you might not have the, the sustainability to both operate the network and to replace it again and again. Um, and then uh, also, there's a lot of complexity involved. I, I think I, I know that there are a number of, of, of the, the wireless community here and uh, who, who are on the call here, and, and they can speak to how um, really uh, it's one thing to go and serve um, a, a good number of people from a rooftop or from an antenna, but it's quite another 
thing if you're really uh, obligated to go serve everybody within an area and, and take an unserved community and turn it into a served community. Uh, it's a difficult thing. And, and I want to understand, is C, everybody understand that is CPC, we are not part of the fiber industry. We are not associated with any carriers. We are not associated with any manufacturers. Um, I work just as well in the fiber realm as in the wireless realm, but there's a time and a place for these, these different approaches. And, and that's what we're, we're, we're trying to speak to now is, um, you know, in, 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 I think it is, is it's an important time to really sort of tackle what, what's going on in, the, in, in a rural broadband deployment where everybody has to be served. Uh, next slide, please. So um, just in brief, for, for those who are, who are new to this, um, uh, fixed wireless is a little bit different from uh, the, the mobile cellular technology that, that, uh, um, that, that many of us are, are familiar with, although some of the mobile providers actually do some, some fixed as well. For the most part, when we talk about fixed wireless, we're talking about infrastructure that's on a, a base station, like a tower, a mast, or a rooftop. Um, you see in this picture here something that's quite common in a rural deployment where you, you make use of the infrastructure that's there. A grain silo could be quite good for for example, because that's that's what, what you need to do is you have to have a flexible uh, approach to, to serve and, and that's that's one way to do it. And what happens with most fixed wireless technologies is that you can serve, depending on which one you deploy, uh, dozens or maybe hundreds of users, um, hundreds, you, you have to have a lot of density really. But all that is, is very much, uh, it depends. It depends on which technology the, there's, rapid evolution in, 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 in wireless, not as rapid as we would like, but um, we're, we're uh, a current generation of wireless is, is a little bit different than before. Uh, an area with uh, of terrain factors and, and uh, of, uh, trees and, and, and so forth and, and different levels of density is going to get greater or fewer numbers of people served from uh, an antenna site. Next slide, please. Another thing to think about is, is spectrum. And um, it's a term that we, we hear a lot about. And um, <clears throat> one way to think about it, I mean, for those in, in my generation is sort of like channels. Uh, used to be you'd have a radio with a dial and the left-hand part of the dial would be the, the low frequency, the high end would be the high uh, frequency. And, and in the world of, of uh, broadband wireless, what we have at the low at the low frequency end is uh, the low band mid band uh, mobile cellular uh, technology. Um, <clears throat> as we increase in our, our frequencies, uh, we have unlicensed uh, fixed wireless. We have uh, what's known as the EBS. Uh, used to be an educational uh, spectrum for um, for video. Uh, it's now uh, primarily used by, uh, in some cases, by uh, T-Mobile, in some cases by other uh, uh, smaller wireless providers. Uh, as we move on in spectrum, we have the Citizens Broadband Radio Service, also known as CBRS, which combines uh, some of the features of licensed and unlicensed technology. And there's some, uh, a, lo a lot of that spectrum is, is, is free and open for, for this sort of uh, fixed wireless use. Some of it is uh, licensed to uh, cable companies and, and, and uh, mobile companies. And then at the very, very high frequency, we have something called millimeter wave. And the thing to know about these bands, if you go through in the order that I just went through from top to bottom, you look at that first arrow, you see low capacity going up to high capacity. And the short way to describe that is you have smaller channels that are available uh, in that low band. And then you go to, uh, when you get up to millimeter wave, you have very wide channels. Wide channels means that you can operate it at much higher speeds. So the question might come up, well, why is anybody bothering with the low band then if the other is faster? And that's because there's a trade-off. And the trade-off has to do with, um, with line of sight. When you're working at the very high frequencies, you have um, a signal 
that is more like a light beam than it is like radio. And so a light beam, we all know if you pick up your hand or a piece of paper or anything, uh, that's the end of that signal. It, it basically, you, you have to have an uninterrupted line of sight as you have very high frequencies. Whereas if you use uh, cell phone technology, it's not perfect, but you can actually have a, a cell site that's five or 10 miles away and you can still uh, connect to it. Uh, those of us who still use uh, broadcast television, it's the same the same idea, but then you're trading off with a lower frequency. So it, it, it's a little bit of a difficult game uh, how to do this. Uh, adding to that is the fact that um, if you are entering uh, the world as a fixed wireless provider, uh, chances are you are not entering the world with the kinds of license spectrum that a mobile provider has. So you, you're you not working with necessarily the, the best and, and most enormous uh, set of spectrum to work with. You're kind of working with what's left over. Uh, many people do that very well, but it's, it's not an easy thing. Next slide. So this is kind of a quick summary of, of not just the, the mobile, of the fixed wireless technologies, but also uh, putting fiber and uh, satellite on, on as well. And uh, this, this is, uh, for those who want to spend more time with it, this is in the, as well as the rest of this is all in the, the report. But, um, and, and there was a question here, will the slides be available? Um, I'll leave that up to CWA, but I think it makes sense for the slides as well as the report to be. Um, available. If you look at the top here, you have the fixed wireless technologies. I'm not going to spend too much time on the speeds at this moment because we're going to go into that on later slides. But you see here with the uh, unlicensed and the, the 4G and 5G solutions, you have uh, a, a latency, which is the amount of time it takes for a signal to go uh, from your location as the, the user to the internet and back again uh, is, is a little bit on the higher end, is significantly on the higher end actually than, than the other technologies. And there are a lot of reasons for this that have to do with the, um, the, the speed at which the equipment processes. It has to do with the, the complexity of trying to combine a lot of signals at once. And so the end result is, is, is that you have a, a high latency um, a delay uh, relative to the other the other technologies. Um, another thing to point is to note out is the the topology that uh, most of the um, the the rural uh, wireless technologies are point to multipoint. That is, uh, you have a. a antenna site, such as in the picture I showed you before, and then you have a lot of points that, that kind of come back to that. And um, that has advantages and disadvantages. Some of the disadvantages include that that tower is a point of failure for, um, in, in other words, if it fails, everyone connected to it goes down. Um, if you go further down the chart here, you see millimeter wave mesh. And the important thing to note about that is that that's an entirely different beast of wireless than the other technologies. It's the, the very high frequency that I mentioned before, um, which means that it's very fast. You can, as you can see here, it, it, it does a gig without really, both directions without really breaking a sweat. Um, and it has very low latency in the way that, that many of the, the people who've built it have configured it. The thing about it is it's not a rural solution. The millimeter wave mesh, you're talking about a couple hundred foot range. Uh, the people who've deployed it, uh, again, it's a mesh. You, you kind of go from rooftop to rooftop to pole to rooftop. It is not gonna be a suitable technology, unfortunately for rural uh, in the foreseeable future, just because uh, you, you want to consider the spacing between houses and farms and so forth in rural areas. It's just not going to work out. So, um, so we want to think about millimeter wet mesh, but we want to think about it more as a primarily urban and suburban uh, solution. Uh, and then you have cable and fiber to the premises. They have very uh, very short, um, very, very uh, low uh, latency, especially fiber here, and you have very high speeds associated with, uh, with fiber uh, as well. Uh, uh, cable uh, not far behind it. And then we have um, at the bottom of the, the chart here, the low Earth orbit satellite. This, this is in particular the, um, uh, the SpaceX Starlink 
and uh, that's kind of mid-range as far as latency, and, and you see some speeds here, which are the, um, the actual speeds that, that Ookla and others have, have measured, and you can see there, you know, it's sort of, you know, just kind of starting out as, uh, as, as a technological solution. So, so here, it, it's a comparison of, of a lot of different uh, things, but I think, let's go to the next slide, because I want to give you a visual of how all these things match up. So, so here we have uh, speeds. I'm just focusing on speed right now, as opposed to um, the uh, the other facets of the technology. And um, and and so the the other thing I want to note here is that you have a range of speeds here. So let's start um, with fiber at the top. And there are a bunch of things I want to just explain about the way that this this diagram works. One is is that everything's in a range. And that's because your the actual speed that you get from one of these technologies is going to depend on things like the range. It's going to depend on the generation of electronics that's connected. Uh, in the case of a uh, cable modem, it's going to depend on how many different people are connected to that part of the cable system. So, so I'm going to present when I'm talking about speeds, when I'm talking about pricing, I'm going to talk about ranges here, because that's the only fair and accurate way to really work with a complex problem like this. The other thing I want to note about fiber on this is that you're you're off to the, if you look um, at the, uh, um, at, at it, there's an arrow at the top, and that's to show that, um, uh, that, that that's essentially, um, we have a technology that that is actually much scalable far, far beyond where it is right now. So I say 100 gigabits per second, but uh, some of some of you who I know who are on this call who are, are big experts in this area can say like, well, Andrew, you know, there's actually, you know, some really top end stuff that they use under the ocean. And that's like thousands of gigabits per second, many times over. So I don't want to go way into that but the physics allows you, you to go uh, much further. Uh, from a practical matter, you see the color coding that I have here. And the darker colors mean that almost every market um, you know, has, has this type of, of, of service. The, the, dark, the dark blue means that, that certain markets have, have this type of service. And the, light, the lightest colors mean that it's a technology that's pretty unusual. Um, that's, that's sort of just emerging right now. And, and if you see, uh, for example, fiber to the premises, what, what that means is that you have a technology that um, using what's called the PON technology that uh, Verizon um, and AT&T fiber use and the ones that uh, many of the municipal utilities and, and some of the, the private uh, smaller uh, independent ISPs are using, that gets you up to about uh, one to 10 gigabits per second at the, the top speed, depending on the details of the network. And then you you go up to the hundred. That's that's in certain uh, more more costly types of deployments. But we can very clearly see that in five or ten years, uh, we're going to have that that darker line go further to the right, and and uh, what is just developmental is going to be more for real. If we look at cable, what we see here is um, also I, I think many. Many uh, people live in markets where the cable company can get you a gig if you want to pay for that service. And um, what would be emerging later in the future with, with the next generation of technology is maybe up to, to 10 um, uh, with that. Um, both of those technologies leave uh, DSL, the phone-based technology, far behind. That's a, a matter of physics. It's a matter of, of copper really not being able to, uh, to keep up. Let's jump down to wireless. What we see here, uh, 4G fixed wireless, that's a little bit loose use of the term, but basically the fixed wireless technologies that have existed up until about 2019 or so. Um, those, those technologies uh, can get up to 100 megabits per second, but you see that it's kind of a continuous line there. And that's because it's going to depend hugely on how many other individuals are connected to the network. It's going to depend a whole lot on how far you are from the antenna, and it's going to depend quite a bit on whether or not you're behind a tree or a mountain. Okay, so we see a big, a big range right there. Uh, 5G fixed wireless technology, uh, that's the, the technologies that are just beginning to emerge right now. 
uh, th those have uh, technological improvements I'll go into in later slides there, you're pushing up into the hundreds of, of megabits per second. But that's, again, uh, in, in a network that it's almost like in a lab setting when you get to the right end of this, where, where you're essentially in a very optimal environment with not very many people using the network, but you tend to be more toward the left as you, as you load the network up. And honestly, if you're deploying the network in a cost-effective, cost um, um, responsible way, you're gonna be a little bit further toward the left, more in the middle of that range, more towards 100 megabits per second. Millimeter wave is mentioned, that's an urban and suburban solution uh, with, uh, with a mesh, and, and there you're talking about one or 10 gigabits per second. There are a number of providers that are beginning to emerge with that technology. Um, <clears throat> This is not something that is uh, in, in, in the big sense feasible in, in rural areas. Um, and then going down to uh, the, the low Earth orbit satellite, uh, that is the Starlink uh, SpaceX solution, you see large improvements on the previous uh, generation of, of, geo, of, um, of satellite, what, what were called the geostationary satellites. But um, you know, again, a, a situation where this is certainly much better than what satellite people had to deal with before. But uh, definitely, um, definitely something that uh, is 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 not up there with the uh, with, with either the fixed wireless or the the wired technologies. Uh, and then you have mobile on the bottom, and and we know that with mobile, there, there's a whole lot of possibilities with 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 mobile, but. Um, we also have a situation where um, that, that speed that you get is very dependent uh, on where you are in a network, what kind of upgrades have been done to the network, the kind of equipment that you are using. Uh, the business model with, with fixed wireless is still very much one where uh, the bits and bytes that you use um, are, are metered. You don't have un unlimited use. And you also have a situation where mobile providers that are uh, looking to be fixed wireless providers are limiting the number of people who can be served in that way because they want to protect the capacity for the mobile users as well. So it's it's definitely a solution that's out there, but it's one, as you can see, that still doesn't keep up with the cable modem or, or the fiber, and it has business uh, case and, and uh, uh, user uh, based uh, issues that, uh, that that are not on this chart, but that we know about. Next slide, please. This is upstream, and um, I'll uh, spend a little bit of time on this just to make sure we don't fall behind on the presentation. But um, I think one thing that's really important to note here is um, uh, we have, again, with fiber to the premises, if we're talking about upstream, the, the speed of communication from you back to the network, the two-way communications that's so important when we're doing things like telemedicine and distance learning. You see, again, fiber of the premises way at the front of the pack because the technology has been configured by, by most of the service providers to be close to symmetrical. And the, 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 the final generations, the ones that are coming out now with fiber to the premises are very, uh, very much uh, symmetrical. That's one of the, the big selling points of fiber relative to cable, which is the next one down. Uh, cable such as it exists right now uh, outside of the lab is this DOCSIS 1 to DOCSIS 3.1, this, this second line right here. And as you can see, um, we're, we're limited in speeds. So I, I actually, in fairness, I think that there are some providers that are going beyond that 25 megs, maybe up to, to 50 megabits per second. But for the most part, uh, there are pretty hard limitations down to the 20 or even 10 megabit per second range. And that becomes one of the, the real limitations uh, in the technology when you start to load it up with uh, a lot of people and a family trying to do Zoom and things like that. Moving further down here, you, you see again, uh, fixed wireless technologies lagging behind the wireline uh, technologies. You see a range once again, because that depends on how many people are on the network and so forth. But you see millimeter wave fixed wireless is, uh, in the mesh configuration is, is again being very strong. Uh, next slide, please. So um, <clears throat> one question that very much comes up 
um, in, in the work that I do is people ask, well, why do we, why do we need all this capacity anyway? Um, you know, we give people 20 megs who only have like dial up speed right now, they should be happy, you know? And, and, and yes, th that is a big improvement, but remember what we're doing right now is, is that this is, this is essentially um, the, um, the, the once in a lifetime upgrade. This is, this is what happened. This is the equivalent of what happened during the depression where um, the country decided to get serious about rural uh, power, uh, rural electrical. So, so basically in the way that, that rural people had a level playing field with um, rural electric um, after that was something that was supported. We want a situation where the people who are unserved now who are going to become served have a level playing field going forward with everybody else uh, who's already served now or the people who were in metro areas where, where the uh, providers do have a business case for constantly investing and reinvesting. So right now what this chart shows, this is a peak, an estimate of peak bandwidth. You can see the elements here of some of the things that we imagine and know actually would be happening in a household of four uh, over on the left hand side it's the daytime estimate where you have people uh, working and on zoom and things like that on the right hand side you have um, you have the utilization that's a little bit more entertainment focused in the evening hopefully our family here gets the opportunity to take some time off and and do entertainment in the evening but in any case the takeaway I want you to have here the big takeaway is I want you to see at the bottom of the screen here, the totaling up is, is a lot of capacity that's needed in the upload. The 18 megabits per second here for uploads starts to really challenge cable systems. Um, it doesn't challenge fiber systems and it really does also challenge a lot of wireless systems as well. Um, it's not it's not impossible, but it's starting to get toward, toward that kind of limit. If we look to the right here where we have this entertainment focus, we have a number of people who were on HD and UHD TV. Um, you, you push beyond the 25 of the FCC and you push into the, the 39 megabits per second. Uh, again, something that seems to be well carried by cable, something that's well carried by fiber, something that um, I think is a challenge for many of the, the fixed wireless providers in the rural areas to, to carry. Next slide, please. So fast forward, let's think about where are we gonna be uh, this 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 little snapshot I'm thinking is five to ten years from now, and we don't really know five to ten years from now. But let's let's rewind five to ten years before now, which was sort of at the advent of smartphones. It was before people really had the idea that they were going to stream video over the internet and that sort of thing. You go ten years before that, and that was the beginning of the commercial internet. So. If we're building a technology, an infrastructure that's going to last 20 years, 30 years, um, you know, honestly, the 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 infrastructure, cabled uh, uh, broadband infrastructure, there's no reason why it shouldn't last 40 or 50 years. If we're going to do that, we really have to be prepared for what comes next. And so we don't know what comes next, but one thing that might come next, if you talk to the people who are in the web 3.0 community, it's this business of augmented virtual reality. And we all think of our Oculus headsets and kids kind of zoning out doing these things that you know we maybe don't think are critical. But really where we are going to be is that the distance learning, uh, telemedicine and a lot of other um, um, the, the activities that we now do with Zoom and with Teams and things like that are the kinds of things that um, are going to become more important here. Those of you who are involved in public safety uh, training, as as I am, um, you know we. This is how this is how we train. I I was involved with an active shooter simulation where you know I was working with. Um, a device in my hand that was supposedly a gun. And, and after you work with this for a while, you actually put that, that remote down so carefully because you were, you were convinced that, you know, actually you're holding something very dangerous in your hand. This is something um, or something like it is going to bring us up to much higher bandwidth. And when we do that, we're talking, if you look in, in the academic reports that are cited in the, the report that, that we're issuing, uh, you see that just using the, 
the um, HD advanced level, which is sort of mid range uh, of, uh, of, of VRAR, uh, you, you start to push up to uh, 400 megabits per sec session uh, symmetrical. If you have a multi general family of 11, which is what you see if you go over to the, the right hand side here, you can multiply that by three, perhaps at the peak and you're already over a gig. So there's always the question like, why are we building a gig? Who wants a gig? And right now, not very many people for not very much, but um, we're building a technology for the future. We don't necessarily even have to have the electronics in place for this to work at that speed, but the physical part, the expensive part that needs to be built and doesn't need to be renewed uh, does have to be in place so that uh, with a flip of a switch or with a, a cheap replacement of a box, you can actually go to that gig, a symmetrical gig, without, without having to, to really uh, revisit everything that you have spent so much money on. Uh, next slide, please. So um, wireless is not sitting still. Um, there are very many things that are going on in the mobile wireless world and in the fixed wireless world that are getting a whole lot more out of the spectrum that we're using and are trying to make a go at, at dealing with the issues of uh, line of sight and the issues of range and that, that sort of thing. So um, one thing that, that many of you have heard of is something called MIMO. Uh, essentially a multi-path type technology that actually uh, tries to make a positive use of the reflections and so forth from uh, objects that you find off the way. And so you, you combine multiple pathways of signal, you get more speed. Um, the um, latest generations of cell phones use that and a lot of fixed wireless technology is beginning to incorporate uh, MIMO very constructively. Another um, concept in wireless that's becoming more important is um, uh, beam forming, where uh, the, the spectrum that, that used to, the, the signal that used to just radiate in all directions and the channel space that, that would, would basically have to be shared by hundreds of people, you could share it by many fewer people. If you take those signals, you send them down to one or two people, you send another signal to one or two people. In other words, the beam finds the user and sets itself up a lot of different ways as opposed to uh, just uh, kind of the waste of, of bandwidth that exists. So, so there's a lot going on uh, in the wireless world that is improving the capacity and usability of, of the signal but um, it is not something, as I'm going to, to discuss here, that, that is keeping up with, um, with fiber, unfortunately. Uh, next slide, please. So the challenges that emerge, even with using the technologies I've just mentioned or the, the, the improvements I've just mentioned with fixed wireless are, are a few. Uh, the main is, is that, that it is very challenging to have a predictable physical connection to everybody. Uh, so if, if you have a certain area, if you are an awardee in a program like uh, Reconnect or RDOF or something along those lines that the federal government is supporting, your job is to serve all those people, okay? And, um, and when you are assigned serving all the people in that area, uh, nobody else is going to get funding to do that. So if, if you have individuals who are not able to connect because they're the ones behind a hill or they're, you know, whatever their, their issue might be, um, that's really a challenge. So uh, you have a line of sight uh, issue between the antennas. You have an issue of spectrum availability. Uh, not all places have a uh, good, good quality or a good amount of spectrum. Uh, you have variability in weather um, that, that could have a significant impact. And you also have uh, issues with, uh, I don't, it's not mentioned here, but uh, uh, trees that kind of leaves kind of grow in and grow out and that kind of thing. And, and uh, just variation of all of those factors over time. So to make this really work right, you have to have a pretty dense deployment of antennas um, because what you're trying to do here is number one, serve everybody. Number two, serve them with a lot of capacity. Number three, make sure that you can you know, keep upgrading that capacity when people need to go faster and, and you need to fulfill the, the requirements of line of sight somehow. Uh, next slide. So this is not easy. Um, what we have here is, is a model that, that we did in a community where um, we actually did a design in, in the wireless realm and, and, and that was actually quite a constructive 
uh, model. It did, it did really uh, do a good job in that community here. The, the, the antenna uh, site, um, if, I'm, if you can see my, my mouse here, is right about here. Um, and then the green is the area where um, our model judges that you're going to have um, uh, the kind of speeds and performance that you really need. When you move into the red, or you move out of the green entirely, you're in an area with substandard performance. The thing to note here is that the with the model is that you it's kind of chewed up here as, as we go around it. And that's because uh, we have some, some terrain and we have trees and so forth. So when we're in the business of trying to come up with a model that serves everybody, you, you're gonna have to you know, look at an area like this. You're gonna look at the fact that no, it does not make a smooth circle. It is unpredictable, it's different. And you have to uh, come up with another antenna site that maybe sits off to the side to start filling that in and yet another one to fill the areas that neither of them fills in and so on and so forth. Next slide. So um, just beginning to go into the detailed models that are in the report here. Uh, the uh, small town uh, model that we picked is uh, Deming, New Mexico. Uh, small, a small town in the southern part of the state. And um, the thing to note about Deming here is uh, the gray part is Deming, okay, not very big. Um, you could, if you look at the blue here, the blue is the coverage area. The best way to think about that is that that's where you'd get some bars for a signal. You would have enough signal that your, your phone or your device would say, okay, I, I can see it, right? The thing is, if you look at all these dots, you can't make it with one dot. That's because there's enough population in Deming that you would run out of capacity, um, even using the 5G technologies that we showed you before. You would not be able to give those people the 100 by 20 service uh, that is the current FCC benchmark. So you have to go in and put up 10 sites uh, to make that, that happen. And that's, that's fine, you do that, but there's cost on, on the per site level. Um, and um, so, so the thing to understand is it's not just enough to get the signal, you have to do the calculation to uh, figure out what does it take to give all the people who need to be connected in your previously unserved area, the signal they need um, and, and to make sure that you do the right kind of calculation so that when enough of them are connected, you don't, you don't max out the network. Next slide, please. So um, if we do a, a compare, we, we, we have four models that we did here, both with um, fixed wireless and with, with fiber. There's the small town model that uh, I just showed you. And then we did three different rural uh, models of varying density. Uh, density is, is pretty much the overwhelming factor in broadband cost uh, per uh, household, whether you're talking about fiber or you're talking about uh, to wireless. So we did we did all three of those, or all, in addition to the small town. Next slide. And um, I'll go through the the cost factors here um, at a high level. Again, the report you're going to get more detail from that. But the, let's look first at the initial capital costs because the capital costs are what's mostly going to be borne by the grant that you would get to build the network here. And um, if we're looking at fiber, fiber generally costs more in the capital cost. There's this upfront cost that's high. Um, that's, that's why we have a diversity of approaches uh, to broadband right now because of, of that, that factor more than anything else. Most of the capital cost for fiber has to do with construction because you're, you're, you're going onto poles, you're digging, you're doing whatever you, know, you need to do to make that happen. And you, you wanna get value, you wanna do it right and you wanna do it safe as we um, you know, mentioned before. And, uh, and therefore, um, you know, it's, it's a very, uh, it's not cheap, right? But you get value for your money. Uh, if we look at capital costs for fixed wireless, um, actually most of the cost in the aggregate is for the, the customer premises equipment. That is the combination of the antenna and the network equipment that sits at the house because you, you have you know, one of them for every household and that really does add up. In, in a rural area, another cost that you have is uh, tower sites where you're either constructing new sites or you're finding a way to use that grain silo or whatever, whatever it is that you're doing here. And 
as we all know, the rural areas are areas where there aren't a lot of those structures already. So, um, so there's a lot of cost that goes into doing this. And then the fact that when you put up one of those sites, uh, think back to the drawing, the, the, the figure I just showed you earlier, you may only have like 10 or 20 people that you can serve off that tower. So that's a lot of, a lot of expenditure on a per household level. Let's go to operational costs because again, as, 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 as the members of the community who actually run networks, that is, that is huge. So for a fixed wireless network, um, uh, the, the, one of the big operational costs is the fact that you are replacing, um, you're replacing all of that equipment that I mentioned above, that customer premises equipment, the equipment that sits on top of the towers there, that's 40 to 80% of the capital investment. And, you know, some people would say five years, because I, I do, I think that's about how long it takes to go from 4G to 5G to 6G. That's what we've we've seen, maybe six, seven, eight years, whatever it is, it's, it's a huge expenditure to go and replace those things and, and physically get out there to do that. Um, but whereas with a fiber network, you've put a lot of money in at the capital cost, but you only have to replace, you only have to spend one to 10% of the capital cost on things like maintenance. And then this also uh, does take into account depreciation. Next slide, please. So um, I've, I'm going to just kind of move more quickly on this. Uh, what you see then here, if you're looking at the 30-year cost, you add all those factors we put together here, you see just this big overlap. Uh, between uh, FTTP, which is the fiber to the premises network, and fixed wireless uh, network. Okay, you have a range because there's always a range, right? Um, the range has to do with things like in fiber between whether you're um, perhaps the, the local power or phone company and you're just kind of putting some fiber up where the copper was before uh, versus if you have to go like digging through the mountain, which would, of course, you take you to the to the right end. Uh, wireless, uh, same kind of thing. You, you have different sorts of issues with line of sight and so forth. But what we really see here is that, you know, you do get to these very high prices as you get to very, very low density there with fiber, but otherwise, um, you know, it's going to depend on the particular situation, but you don't see an enormous difference in these costs when you go over the long term. Next slide. So um, to, to clear up here, um, we believe based on the performance issues that were discussed here and um, the cost numbers that are here that were done in extreme detail by, um, by our very talented fiber and wireless teams, um, uh, at, at CTC, um, we we think that uh, we know that that fiber is the best long term choice for the overwhelming majority of of rural areas because in this instance of our history where where the capital money can be spent right now to make this work, uh, it's the opportunity to create just like with um, the uh, rural electrification the infrastructure that can put our our rural communities. Uh, in an even uh, uh, place with our, um, our served communities in the urban and, and suburban and built up uh, areas. And again, this has to do with the fact that the fiber is sustainable, scalable, and renewable, um, that we can keep on upgrading it just by changing out the electronics at the end. Um, if we take into account the fact that the, the upgrade of fixed wireless, which does have to happen just like any technology, is, is replacing most of the capital expenditure, plus the fact that there are expensive towers and infrastructure that have to be built in those areas. Um, the, the costs really even out over that long period of time. And then finally, just the challenge is that despite the, the very creative and, and uh, thoughtful and Herculean efforts of our wireless uh, ISP community, that it is just very, very difficult to, to take a community from unserved to served purely using fixed wireless technologies because of the challenge of line of sight. So with that, I thank everybody for their time. Um, I'm looking forward to a discussion here, and I'm also um, very uh, excited that, that the uh, report is going to uh, to reach a, a large audience. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andrew. And we'll open up for Q&A. Um, I see, uh, Regina, uh, feel free to, um, I don't know if you can unmute yourself, but if you can, feel free to speak up. But Regina's question from, from Turn in California is, um, 
is this conclusion side slide in the report. Uh, and Regina, good, I'm good to, to, to see that you're on. Um, and uh, yeah, yes, uh, not not as such, but it's actually it's better. It's in much more more detail, and there are, there are a few other conclusions that are of value. So this this is this is kind of the high level version. Yeah, there's a section on recommendations. Um, so if anyone else would like to ask a question or um, provide your reactions, uh, feel free to jump into the Q&A box. Uh, you can also raise your hand and we can authorize you to speak if you'd like to. We know this is a hot topic, so um, I'll just ask Andrew one question about, you know, the fixed wireless industry is 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 lobbying very heavily for states to give equal preference to uh, fixed wireless technologies along with broadband, and they're pointing out the technology neutrality that's in the statute for the Infrastructure Act, um, but there's also very strong fiber preference language in the NTIA notice of funding opportunity. So um, what would you say to states as they're considering how they develop their uh, their point system or however they're going to select um, the, the technologies in their grant program and if they're also worried about limited funds? Of course. So um, what, what I would say is it's not an easy job that you have right now uh, running running these broadband programs for the states. There's so much uh, involved and uh, and and I very much respect that and hope that the, this work can be of, of use to you. We focus primarily on the technical uh, issues and and I think what I would encourage is again when you're looking at um, if if your choice is to look at at the whole range of technologies, uh, the fixed wireless, the um, fiber, uh, maybe cable extensions and so forth, it's just I, I think very important that that the um, that the applicant demonstrate the ability to fully serve um, the areas that are supposed to be served so that you understand how and if the, the people who are maybe behind the trees or you know in the valleys or whatever are going to get connected and that there's also um, a clear plan for just constantly renewing this so that five, 10, 15 years down the road, um, the system is still a viable system and it's still providing the kind of capacity. That's a difficult thing to do. And, and, and part of it is if you look at a number of, of wireless internet service providers who've been working very hard and faithfully in that area, many of those, those providers are now looking to build fiber uh, under, um, un, under the IAJA Funds. They're they're becoming hybrid, or they're becoming uh, maybe full uh, fiber providers in the in the new areas because it's it's a challenge to to address it, and that's the choice that that they that they make. Thanks, Andrew. Um, Charles Spann has a question. You can see here. I don't disagree with some of your comments. However, household density per mile make FTTP cost prohibitive in areas like rural Texas, Alaska, Kansas. Wouldn't you agree? And I just add to that. Um, what numerical percentage of locations would you say you know that applies to, Andrew? I haven't really done that that calculation, but I again, you know, we're looking here at New Mexico, for example. That low density rural area is not low, low, low density. You know, in New Mexico, I mean, there are places where you you have just a handful of households within ten miles and so forth. So I I agree that there are areas like that, but some of those areas, frankly, aren't so good for fixed wireless. Some of those might be uh, satellite or TBD and so forth. So you, you'll see that in the report and in the slide deck, I say most, almost all that that sort of thing. And and so I I I'm I am not dogmatic about this uh, to that to that extent. I, I I completely buy what you're saying, but I think even in that case, it's really important to to focus on the the is that approach the fixed wireless approach uh, can it be demonstrated to be sustainable and are you going to serve all the people that um, that you propose to serve in that area thanks um lynn asks a question is ctc sending this report to states lawmakers etc um i will say from the cwa side we'll certainly be sharing this report with the 
uh, the state legislators, governor's offices, um, and broadband offices that were speaking to around the country. Andrew, do you want to add anything to that? Um, I, I think also the Benton Foundation is, is taking a very proactive approach to getting getting the word out about the report. Certainly, I'd like it to be you know available to, to anyone in that community. Great. And James asks, uh, can you recommend companies that rural counties can consult with for the design of countywide fiber to the home networks? Oh, well, you know, I, I don't want to use this as an option for self-promotion and so forth here, but there are many, you know, there are many companies that are out doing that kind of work. I would, I would uh, primarily you know, make sure that the uh, the company that you're you're looking for has a has a track record um, with um, with some of the, the the companies that have been successful on deployment, like the the municipal um, uh, electricals and the co-ops, and 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 with uh, some of the the carriers as well. Um, and uh, of course, you know, it's a busy time for everybody in broadband, so you'd want to make sure that uh, that they were able to uh, to to deliver on the timeline that you needed. I would also just say, in terms of vetting consultants, um, the National Association of Telecom Officers and Advisors, NATOA, is a professional association of, of local government officials who work in telecom and, and cable franchising and things like that. And they are really knowledgeable about this um, and have a lot of those relationships with professional advisors. So um, if you're jurisdiction, your community is not in touch with NATOA, that's a great resource. Um, and uh, Regina has another question. Um, Andrew, if you can talk about uh, the need for fiber to support wireless services, and then we'll take just a couple more questions before we have to wrap so that we don't go uh, beyond the hour. So of course, um, to do of uh, wireless services, particularly the mobile services where there are many, many um, people connected at any given site, uh, you do need fiber connectivity to the very high um, high use towers. The report uh, contemplates a mixture of, of wireless and fiber connections. So the idea, um, Regina, is that you would, you would hit um, uh, in, in an area that's very low population low density that 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 a couple of locations would get fiber connected and then there would be a fixed wireless connection if you had relatively few but in the big picture that's exactly right that that where there's wireless there has to be fiber um, and uh, and that's that's part of of the cost of, of making it happen no matter what technology you use um great and then I think just um we don't really have any more questions here Lynn says that um uh, is there a one-page summary that we can use? Yes. Uh, well, CWA is a one-pager we can share, but also we're going to make the executive summary of this available, which is a good option to use. Um, uh, so we have various resources like that uh, that, that you can uh, reach out to CTC or CWA about. And, and um, I'll just put in the chat my email if anyone would like to reach out directly um, to CWA. And then Mike Belding says that Green County, Pennsylvania is on phase three of a $9 million fiber optic cable installation in a very rural, tough terrain environment. CTC provided their feasibility study and they went through all the alternatives and settled on fiber for all the reasons discussed. So thank you so much, Mike, for that testimonial that really speaks to the issues that are being addressed here uh, today. And then James, um, I'm not sure if you were asking about the National Association of Telecom officers and advisors, or if there was something else um, we referred to that you were asking about, but um, feel free to follow up directly. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, we will make the, the slides and report available to everyone who registered for the webinar today. We really want to get the word out and uh, happy to be a resource for uh, any anyone uh, you or your communities, uh, please reach out and we will do our best to connect you with resources related the, to the, the techno technologies that Andrew talked about today. So um, with that, we'll, we'll wrap it up and thank you again, Andrew.